Hello and welcome to our culture magazine here on I-24 News. I'm Odette Grober. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, a wonderful show for you. We'll celebrate the Bacheva Dance Company's 50th anniversary. And we'll take a humorous look at the Israeli army. But we begin with American actor Eli Wallach, who died Tuesday at the age of 98. Wallach earned his place in film history with the role of Tuco in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. Wallach's career spent six decades with more than 80 film roles and hundreds of TV appearances. The actor started his career on the stage after studying under Lee Strasberg and appearing in plays in New York and London. During the 60s, he played some of his most famous film roles in The Magnificent Seven and John Huston's The Misfits. In the 70s, following The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, Wallach's acted in several more spaghetti westerns. In the 80s, his career slowed down, but he returned to the limelight in the last two decades as a beloved veteran actor. His last film role was in Oliver Stone's 2010 film Wall Street Money Never Sleeps. While Wallach never won an Academy Award, he did receive an honorary Oscar in 2010 for his celebrated wide-ranging career. We will, of course, always remember this important piece of advice. <laughs> When you have to shoot, shoot, don't talk. The Bacheva Dance Company, Israel's best known and most celebrated dance institution, is celebrating its 50th anniversary. In honor of the occasion, Sandy Foltis prepared a story about the company's very first performance. Let's take a look. December 16, 1964. For the first time in history, the curtain rose on a young dancing troupe. Thus, the Bacheva Dance Company was born. The show took place in Tel Aviv at the Habima Theater. The troupe was formed only a few months prior to perform Celebrants by British choreographer Robert Cohen. The excitement of the press before and after the event was reflected in the positive reviews the performance received. <laughs> והצצנו. אני זוכרת שעמדתי מאחרי המסך שיש על הבמה, והייתי עומדת, שומעת את המוזיקה, ואז הרגשתי שאיזשהו כוח דוחף אותי על הבמה, וזה היה פשוט שלמות. This wild idea came from Baroness Batsheva de Rothschild, the English philanthropist who moved to Israel in 1951, taking up the name Batsheva. Another equally famous figure took over the artistic direction, leading choreographer and modern dance legend Martha Graham. This historic evening of December 16 conquered the audience. For the first time in history, a young country, overwhelmed by tensions, was enjoying a wonderful demonstration of levity. In dance, what remains are the memories, and that first season of the Batsheva Dance Group, now celebrating its 50th anniversary, are, is unforgettable. <laughs> לא שיר לשים במגירה, לא ציור לתלות על הקיר, אלא רק את אותו רגע על הבמה שבו אתה מרגיש חי את החיים. Staying with the Batsheva Company, Iris Lana, a dance scholar and historian, is heading the project to create an archive for the company, documenting its history from its early days under the guidance of Martha Graham through its time with Ohad Naharin till today. The archive will preserve the story of this unique artistic establishment. I'm very happy to welcome Iris Lana to our studio. Thanks for coming in today. Thank you. So tell me a little bit about the, the archive project. 
The archive started um, at uh, two years ago, actually, uh, when the company was heading his uh, uh, its uh, 50th anniversary, mm -hmm. and uh, and they found out that uh, there was no uh, collecting, uh, nobody collected the methodically at, uh, the archive archival material, and uh, but how could that be? I think most of the cultural uh, institutions do not do that. And it's also concerning the modern times where nobody looks back, everybody right. looks forward, and what happened is not important anymore. This was the concept. And uh, they, yes. they, they changed, changed it. They changed their mind. Yes, they changed. <laughs> Actually, the change is, uh, is, is giant, because I think it affects other institutions as well. I see. And what, what do you hope to, to achieve with the, with the archive? Um, first, making the archive archive, it means that you uh, you collect all the material, archival material, and you put it somewhere where, where it is accessible for the public, general public and researchers. Mm -hmm. And uh, the archive is, can enable intellectual activity, theories, writing, filming, uh, right. all the activity around dance, which is very uh, common in other arts and less in dance. I see. So this let's, is my... let's go back to the, the early days of Bacheva, mm -hmm. when, when it's founder, Bacheva de Rothschild uh, started the company. Why was it important for her to have a dance company? I think she was, uh, she knew the dance field in Israel in the 50s because she was here already. And uh, she knew general, um, some uh, uh, person, persons that uh, deals with dance. And she knew Martha Graham very well from her days in New York. Mm -hmm. And she just made one and one and um, saw so uh, an opportunity to, to connect to connect and uh, she knew that uh, the dance field was really ready for change I see now uh, while working on on these this project uh, building this uh, archive putting it together there are some holes that you you come across some serious ones I understand there was nothing, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I mean this is where we started. We thought that there is nothing, but actually in different institutions and then in personal uh, back, back rooms of mm -hmm. you know all the people in the company, everybody kept things. How so, many people are we talking about here? Uh, 1,400. Okay. Uh, Alive. And were they eager to, to, to present the material? I think they were ambivalent. Uh, they were eager, they were suspicious, nobody ever did such a thing, they never knew what is going to, became, to become out of it. It was not easy, emotionally it's not easy to build an archive. Usually most of the archives yeah. are sitting back and they wait people to... Um, to bring it to, to them. Yes, to yeah. bring it to them. Nobody, But we did something very actively. We just went to people who are in, we are in contact with hundreds of people. Mm -hmm. And it, this was very interesting and it, uh, I think this is why we got so many uh, beautiful and very rare uh, facts, things. Uh, yeah. uh, now, somewhere in the 80s, the, the Bacheva Dance Company experienced a less than wonderful uh, time. Going back now, or looking back at the, all those decades, can you find an explanation? Is there some light you mm. can shed on it? I just don't agree. Okay. I think th this is one of the things that the archive does. It's... Um, when you don't have the knowledge, you don't have the facts, you used to make a, a very general story, which is not accurate. And now we have the possibility to look at real things, what really happened. And when you look at the 80s, mm -hmm. the activity was giant, was enormous. It was international, local. They had a, a, a lot of uh, a crowd to come, a lot of public came. So it's just not true. So it's, it's just not <laughs> no. true. Okay, but but there is this this yes. there, there is this um, view of the company yeah. Be before Ohad Naharin yeah. um, that it wasn't. You think it's? I think it's completely think it's, made up. Yeah, well, I, not uh, made up. I think it's. Uh, it's no, no. I don't think it's true. Yeah, okay. yeah, there was there was the decade that uh, the company was acting uh, with the big influence of Martha Graham. Yeah. She was uh, the artistic director. She brought all the big choreographers from right. abroad. So, in what way did Ohad Naharin change the company, reinvent the company? Maybe I think in the eighties, when they mainly the technique was classical ballet. Yeah. Uh, when he came. He was uh, one main, it was not a repertoire company anymore. It was his company from the beginning, although he invited some choreographer, but mainly 
uh, the creations were his, dances were his. And he was looking for performers with enigma and charisma and less with technique. So, uh, and also the process that he did with dancers was not like two months. They, they, he worked with right. them for, he created a language. So this is a big difference. He did, and uh, we're all enjoying it uh, today as well. Uh, yeah. Iris Lana, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you so much. <laughs> In a moment, we'll take a look at how Israeli comedies portrays the army. But first, a few cultural events from around the world. Holler if you hear me, a jukebox musical based on the music catalog of Tupac, bringing a refreshing sound to Broadway by featuring over 20 songs by the late legendary rapper, bringing rare content as guns, gang life, and explicit language to the usually bright-eyed Broadway stages. Holler if you hear me, features cult rapper and slam poet Saul Williams in the lead role. The show will run through 2014. One of the most iconic music festivals in the world since the 1970s, Glastonbury Festival 2014 is expecting its usual mix of rain, mud and rock and roll, as the stages will host bands such as Arcade Fire, Pixies and Metallica. Veteran acts as Dolly Parton and Blondie will mix alongside the newcomers such as the critically acclaimed electronic musical duo Disclosure. Glastonbury Festival will run from June 25 to the 29th. Eva Kafri, recipient of the 2013 Rappaport Award for the young Israeli painter, represents her highly colorful, spatially challenging abstract works at her own exhibition at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Her work has been described as engaging art with a wild spontaneity and carefully executed precision. The original compositions allow for multiple perspectives on the same shapes. The exhibition closes September the 27th. And now it's, uh, it's time for some laughs. So Benjamin, Benjamin uh, Tobias, film critic for uh, daily newspaper Idiot Achonot is joining me. Hello. Laughs in the army. Yeah. I don't remember my army service as very funny. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, but this is something that Israelis like to laugh about, especially the last few decades. So, yeah, certainly. Uh, so how far back does it go? I think the main first film that everybody knows and everybody remembers is Israel is uh, uh, Givat Khalfon, or uh, the Khalfon Unit Doesn't Answer, which was directed by Asi Dayan mm -hmm. in 1975, uh, 1976. And uh, it, what's important about it, it's also it came after the Yom Kippur War. So mm -hmm. we are talking, of course, uh, days where people were more critical about the Israeli army. It was the first time that it was possible to make such criticism about Israeli army, portray the Israeli soldiers as lazy people, as people who don't want to do any job. So yeah. again, you know, what, let's let's uh, take a look at this uh, the moment from this classic. <laughs> <laughs> so this is obviously there's some criticism there, but it's also it looks like it's it's made with a lot of love. Yeah, of course you must remember that for Israelis the army is the sort of the melting pot. I mean everybody or let's say everybody from the Jew secular society has passed through there. So when people go to see a comedy about the army, of course they are going to see a comedy about themselves to remember their own service. So it's a way also to identify yourself as an Israeli. Mm -hmm. You say, mm -hmm. oh, I rem it reminds me about my military service, the times I, I was young, the time I was a soldier. How funny yeah, was it? Right. But how good was it? Yeah. How did it change over the years? I mean, we, we saw that from the 70s. A few years have passed. What are we seeing now? Yeah, I think that if we go, let's say, from the 70s to the 90s and the beginning of the 2000s, so you see more critical films about the army and, of, of course, more critical comedy about the army. So, mm -hmm. of course, you have the TV series, The Five from the Camry, which is, of course, a very leftist show. And there you see sketches that show the army in a very absurd way, a very critical way, um, that laugh about all the 
Israeli uh, culture of war. Right. Um, and, and I think that there they, they also had a more political message in a, in a way. Let's let's move to, to the film that, that just came out recently in Israel, Zero Motivation, one at the uh, Tribeca Film Festival that also is very similar. Yeah, and what is interesting about this movie is, of course, that this is a movie made by a female director and has a female view on the Israeli army and the, and the Israeli society. So, of course, the experience of Israeli soldiers is very time marginalized. And mm -hmm. as we can see in this movie, which is very funny, they mostly do bureaucratic work. So this is, again, a view as of the army as something unheroic, uh, uninteresting, very lazy, um, with no point. So again, it's a more absurdist way to look at the so army. It's a documentary? No. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think I think many many of my female friends which saw this uh, which saw this movie said, oh, it's exactly uh, yeah, like yeah, my service. Yeah. Uh, but I still remember, only funnier. Yeah, only funnier. I mean, we always see about women and soldier. We see here combatants, but this is a very, very small percentage. Right. All right, Benjamin Tobias, uh, thank you so much for this. All right, thank you. Thank you for uh, joining me as well. Please be sure to join us again tomorrow for a whole new culture.